Are you able to identify when someone is taking the scripture and twisting it? Well, we want to look at a few things here in this video to talk about how you can identify false teachers on YouTube who twist the scripture. Ricky Gantz here with G220 Ministries, and I want to welcome you back to this series on how to identify false teachers on social media. It's very important that we understand that when it comes to false teachers, they will twist Scripture. They will take the Word of God and twist it to use it for their own purposes, their own benefits. So the very first thing that I want to talk about is context. When looking to identify whether or not one is a false teacher, you have to ask yourself, are they taking passages out of context? Context is key when it comes to interpreting the Word of God. Uh, the first principle in, in hermeneutics is context, context, context. Always look to the context. You have an immediate context, a broader context. And so you're always looking to see, is this passage that is being taught being taught within the context in which you find it? Or are they using it out of the context to twist it for their own purpose and, again, benefit? One of the passages that comes to mind when I think of this is Matthew chapter 18, where this passage is dealing with church discipline. And yet people will take a, a passage of this or a, a verse of this where it says, where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst and say that, hey, this gives us the right that a couple of us can get together and we can do church. We can do church at a, at a coffee shop, just getting together and hanging out. We can go out and do some evangelism on the street and, hey, we're doing church because there's two or three of us here gathered together. Or a couple people get together to pray and they say, we're doing church because there's two or three of us. But that is not the context. God is omnipresent. He's everywhere all the time. But the context of this is dealing with church discipline. And there's a process that takes place within this passage. And then whatever the outcome, whatever the decision is in dealing with this discipline within the church, a local church, God is saying, I am there in the midst of this. I am with you in your decision. And so therefore, it is important that we take passages in context. Another one that is often taken out of context is Matthew 7, where it deals with judge not lest ye be judged. People will take this out of context and use it as a way to say, you are not allowed to judge people. You're not allowed to make judgments. But scripture as a whole, if you read that context, you see that that's not the case. It's dealing with self-righteous judgment, hypocritical judgment, but not judgment as a whole. Because if you look at the scripture in that context, and then as a whole, you see that the Bible tells us to judge rightly, to judge rightly. And so these are ways in which people will take scripture out of context for their own personal gain. Another way that people have uh, twisted the context of scripture to, you know, benefit them. Uh, you think of cult leaders who get people to be so dependent upon them that they follow them even to death. That's happened in, in, in history. And so one of the things that comes to mind is when the rich young ruler comes to Jesus and asks him, what must I do to inherit the eternal life? And Christ says to him, well, have you kept the law? And he says, well, I've, I've kept all the law since my youth. He, he believed that he was a law keeper from youth and never violating the law of God. And Christ tells him, well, go and sell all you have, give it to the poor, and follow me. And so some who manipulate Scripture, take things out of context, have used this to abuse people, to uh, manipulate people, to follow them in a cult-like mindset or mentality where they say, look, you have to sell everything you have and come follow me. And so though those individuals, for them to follow God, is selling everything and then coming and living under the um, care of this person who is teaching them, and they're able to manipulate them in that, in that sense. And so this is why it is so very 
important to make sure we are taking the passages in context. And so when you're looking to identify one who may be twisting scripture, you have to ask that question again, are they taking the passage out of context or are they keeping it in the right context? Now, our next point is related to our first point, and it is called collapsing context. This is where an individual or group will teach something by taking a couple verses and putting them together. Now, if you paid attention to the first point, hopefully that would be an indication that you would already see, whoa, they're taking something out of context. But what they do, because Scripture does interpret Scripture, and we can utilize Scripture from other passages to to affirm something that is taught in the Bible, we do this with systematic theology. But in this case, what the individual or group does is they take two verses that are not related to identify a doctrine that they teach or something that they are falsely bringing forth. For example... Mormons believe that everyone is spiritual beings uh, before they are born in, in the human sense. And so therefore, they're already up there waiting for a body. And so because of that teaching, they will take this passage, Jeremiah 1.5, which says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. They will take this passage to say, well, see, before Jeremiah was born, he already existed in heaven. And they will also take, first, they will also take John 1, 2 and verse 14, where we we see Christ, who is God, existing with the Father and then becoming flesh. And they will take that and see, okay, so he knew Jeremiah before he was born, Christ existed with God before he came into human flesh in verse 14. Well, this this proves our doctrine that we existed in heaven as spirit children, and then we receive a body at some point. That is not what these passages are are teaching, uh, because uh, this is what is considered collapsing context. Because Jeremiah 1.5, it speaks of God's foreknowledge of Jeremiah, not his pre-mortal existence. Uh, and uh, John 1, 2 refers to the pre-existence of God's Son, Christ, who was always here. He always existed. And this is not uh, being used to, to say that humans existed prior to their coming into a human body. Um, but this is a, one, of the, the, one of the ways in which you have to look for false teachers. Uh, they will use collapsing context. Next, I want to talk about how false teachers will misapply descriptive text and prescriptive text. Now, when we're reading the Bible, there are passages that are describing something that has happened in history that God is laying out for us to further along his story of bringing forth his son. And so there are events that have happened and the Bible is describing these events. And then there's prescriptive text where God is giving us commands. He's giving us instruct, instructions. So and that's exactly what these are. Descriptive texts are those that simply describe what is happening without giving a command or instruction to us for how to behave and, and live. Whereas prescriptive, as I said, these are texts that are instructive. They give us commands on either what to do or what not to do. And so... What false teachers will do is they will take descriptive text and make them prescriptive. And so this is one of the areas in which you want to watch when identifying false teachers. Watch out for inaccurate quotations. This is where people will quote passages from the Bible, Scripture, but they will do it inaccurately. For example, have you heard people suggest that money is the root of all evil? Well, if you look at that passage, it's not that the money is the root of all evil. It's the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And so it's putting that emphasis on the the money not being the evil object, but the love of it. 
so much so that one makes it an idol. It's the love of money. And so are people quoting the passages accurately? Because it's very important. Jehovah Witnesses will take John 1.1 1, 1, and they will inaccurately quote it. They actually insert into it a God rather than the fact that Jesus is God. And so in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God in the actual Scripture. But in theirs, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. They add that. They do not quote it accurately. They add to it. And so inaccurate quotations is another way in which we want to look to identify false teachers. The next point that I want to cover that you need to watch out for, be on the lookout for, be alert, is what is called a biblical hook. Now, if you've ever gone fishing, you know, you, you put the bait on the hook, you throw it in the water, and once you get a bite, you, you reel it in because you've caught that fish. Well, this is what false teachers do. Uh, false teachers will use a biblical hook. They will take a passage of scripture, maybe a verse, maybe a couple scriptures, and they will read it in the beginning of their message. But if you listen sometimes with these false teachers, is their message has nothing to do with what they've thrown out there. Again, they twist it, they take it out of context, but they used it as a hook to reel you in and then go completely in a different direction, not even taking that passage and applying it to what it is actually stating within its context. And so watch out for those who use those biblical hooks. They throw it out there as a way to bring you in. Oh, he's using scripture, so therefore it must be, must be biblical. But listen to how they apply their message to that passage in which they are quote-unquote preaching from. Another way in which false teachers twist scripture is with wordplay. They will use a word that has a meaning and then try to apply that to every situation in life that deem, they deem fit or deem fits their agenda, fits their teaching. For example, the so-called Hebrew Israelites will use Deuteronomy 28 as a way to say that they are the true Israel of God. And they will do that by saying that these true Israelites came over in slave ships to America, and America is Egypt. America is this house of bondage. Because they will take the word Egypt in Deuteronomy 28.68, where it says, "...and the Lord will bring you back in ships to Egypt." a journey that I promised that you should never make again. And there you shall offer yourselves for sale to your enemies as male and female slaves, but there will be no buyer. And so they take this and say, well, Egypt means house of bondage. And where did we go in ships over to, to be put into bondage? And they'll use this to say, this is representative of the transatlantic slave trade. And that Egypt meaning house of bondage is referring to America, that we are in bondage in America. And that is not what this is referring to. Moses writing Deuteronomy here is referring to the Israelite people at that time who did experience these things throughout um, their, their, their time and their in, of, with their disobedience to God uh, through the Babylonian captivity uh, in 70 AD. Uh, Israel was judged finally and completely uh, for their covenant breaking. And so this here is not referring to that, but they're taking this word and trying to apply it, trying to insert in it a meaning that fits with their theology, with their teaching. And so watch out for those who do wordplay. My next point is the figurative fallacy. There is symbolic language, figurative language in Scripture as well as literal language in Scripture. You understand and interpret the Scripture based upon the context and based upon the genre in which you find the context of that passage. And so watch out for those who take figurative language and try to make it literal language or literal language and try to make it figurative. I think you have to, again, 
understand context, which goes back to our very first point, and read it in light of the full context and the genre in which it is being conveyed to us through the scripture. Now we're almost finished. We're almost finished with this identifying false teachers by the twisting of scripture. Uh, but the, the next one I want to, to look at is the obvious fallacy. When it comes to scripture, someone will give their interpretation of how something should be laid out. And then when doing so, they will use words like obviously, undoubtedly, certainly, all reasonable people hold to that. Um, and while there may be truth in that, you have to find it by looking at the context, context in the individual passage, context as a whole, uh, that again, it applies all throughout this for identifying one who is twisting scripture, but they will use this to get their people that are following them to not question what they are saying. So if I was to give you a passage of scripture and say, well, obviously this teaches this and it's certain and only somebody who's reasonable would, 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 would get this. And somebody who's not, you're implying someone who is unintelligent, someone who is unable to understand, they, would, they wouldn't get it. And so it's obvious that this must be the, the correct interpretation of things. So this is something you got to watch for. And again, it really does come back to looking at the context, always verifying whether or not what the individual is teaching aligns with the scripture. That's what you want to look at. Um, because... I can say obviously, or anyone can say obviously, this is what it means, but you need to verify and check and see if what they are saying aligns with scripture, if they're actually taking it within its context, or are they twisting it for their own gain and benefit? Now, my second to last point here is supplementing biblical authority. This is where someone says they receive new revelation or God has called them to something now, they can't identify in the scripture how this new revelation fits with the scripture as a whole. It's new revelation. So they are really then the, the basis for which they are making this claim. They are then the authority for which they are making this claim. Well, anytime someone does this, anytime someone says, well, they're called by God to do this, you really have to check scripture. You really have to look and see, does this contradict anywhere else in Scripture? Because if it does, then they're twisting Scripture. They're trying to claim an authority on the same level as Scripture from God while not lining with the rest of God's Word. For example, there in Timothy and Titus, it gives us the qualifications for elders, pastors, bishops. And this qualification is for men, men only. And so there will be women who will say, well, God has called me to this position. God has called me to pastor. Well, this new revelation that you're receiving that God is calling you to this position doesn't align with Scripture. Now, when identifying people on social media who are false teachers, you have to listen because they will say, God has called me to this ministry. And while they're using that to say, God has called me to shepherd these people on social media, uh, the, the social media is not the church. Uh, there's no calling to being a pastor on social media. There's no calling to shepherding the flock of God on social media. It's a tool that we can use but you have to watch for these people who are supplementing biblical authority with this revelation or these calling that they say they're receiving from God that doesn't align with the scripture. Uh, the, the scriptures speak much on the importance of the local church and being gathered together within the body. Now, again, that doesn't mean that we can't utilize social media. I'm using it right now as a, as a benefit, but it never replaces that. God isn't called me to social media ministry. And so therefore, watch for those individuals who supplement biblical authority for authority that is coming from themselves. Now, my last point, the last thing I want to talk about is rejecting biblical authority. So you have those who will supplement it, and now we come to those who outright just reject biblical authority. 
This is, they will either reject a text or words or a whole passage um, because, or a book, because they don't like what it says because it disagrees with the theology in which they're trying to put forth. So I'll use this in, as an example. Again, I use them because they're, they're very um, fresh in my mind. But when dealing with Hebrew Israelites, they will often pit Paul against Jesus or Paul against the rest of Scripture because their doctrine doesn't allow for the things that Paul teaches. And so they'll say, well, you don't understand Paul or Paul was going off there. Paul was wrong. He got it wrong there. And this is what happens when one is rejecting biblical authority. Another example, when it comes to homosexuality, the Bible clearly states that it is sin and that it is an abomination before the Lord. But there are those who will claim to be Christian pastors and they reject the biblical authority and say, well, no, the word's never used. And they come up with all these excuses to reject the authority of Scripture and claim that it's saying something that it doesn't say. And so watch out for those who reject biblical authority. Now, I hope these were helpful in helping you identify those who are twisting the scripture or rejecting the scripture. Because it is so vitally important that we understand uh, the scriptures rightly understood within its context and watch out for these signs of those who would twist it for their own purpose, for their own benefit, and their own gain.